All right. Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order the Finance and Audit Committee meeting um, for Monday, August 21st. If you would all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank everyone for coming. Uh, first on the agenda, we have uh, the approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion for the approval? Motion. Second. A second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Um, any nays? Okay. None. The motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda is a public comment on agenda items. We have three minutes per speaker. Do we have anyone signed up? No, we don't. Okay. Uh, next is a presentation uh, on our fiscal year proposed fiscal year 2018 operating and capital budgets. We have Mr. Seward. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Jeff Seward, Chief Financial Officer for HART. Um, this morning, I would like to go over the proposed FY 2018 operating uh, and capital budgets. Um, talk to you about where uh, and where we are right now in, in the development process and what we anticipate bringing you um, and the board at our public hearings um, in September. So first and foremost, um, we've had some conversations with you uh, over uh, almost um, since the winter of the um, environment in which we are developing the budget and have been developing the budget for FY18, uh, a series of um, drivers um, of where we're going to be and, and what um, led us to the decisions that we needed to make this coming year. So the slide that I've shown uh, a couple of times on budgetary pressures for FY18 um, uh, continue to, to be the same. Um, in, since 2014, uh, including this fiscal year, uh, we will have used about $15 million out of fund balance. And I'll come back to that uh, during this presentation and talk a little bit about how we're going to mitigate um, the future use of that funding. Again, we have a three-year impact of our uh, bargaining agreements. Um, and again, uh, during our presentation, we're going to show you how that's affected not only this year, but um, next year and how we're moving forward with mitigating that as well. And then continued increases in personal fringes and a liability insurance. Uh, human resource staff will talk to you today about um, our plans uh, for our health care plans going forward. And again, how we're um, attacking those expenses and we plan on mitigating those as well over the next year. And then... We still see a decline in ridership. Uh, we've talked about that over the last uh, few months as well, where we're continuing to see that. And then the implications of um, ridership uh, pursuant to uh, the Mission Max or the COA service changes that the board approved um, a couple of weeks ago. However, some good news. I brought a prop. Just as the moon <laughs> is taking out the sun, we took out that deficit. Are those for sale? Yes. <laughs> I am in finance, and yes, indeed, they are. I'll talk to you after. One dollar, okay. but I'm making a deal for 50. <laughs> it's revenue, revenue generation. That's right. That's right. All right, so where are we overall with our 2018 operating budget? I had the opportunity to talk with many of you one-on-one um, -on -one concerning um, budget development and, and where we had anticipated we would be this morning. And again, pursuant to, pursuant to statute, uh, in, in September, a balanced budget has to be presented to you. Well, we're presenting a balanced budget to you today. And there was a deficit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that deficit w was mitigated in, in a, a couple of minutes. Right now, we're looking at a balanced operating budget of $70,856,175. Now, knowing everything that we've talked about over the last few months, the approval of the COA, the reductions in operating costs that, that, we, that staff has worked very hard on achieving over the last few months, you only see a $1.8 million number lower than the fiscal year 17 budget that you're in today. So... Why, Mr. Seward, is there only a $1.8 million uh, difference in the budget? Well, as we have talked about uh, a couple of times, uh, particularly with, with this committee, 
is that we are looking at cash balance in the development of our future out-year budgets and trying to recalibrate as much as possible our true spending with planned spending so that both actually align in the next year in the next year to two to three years where we don't dig into fund balance anymore. So if you may recall, back in April, I presented a $13 million number as a, as a high-level, very soft delta that we had of what we needed to, to reduce our operating costs to get us to a balanced budget going into FY18. So again, the focus has been on actual spending, not the budget. So there are two distinct issues, as you, as you are aware. So based on anticipated actual spending and what we have spent, we were really looking at a starting point of about a $77 million budget which was our starting point for development. So we knew, based on how we have been spending, our anticipated revenues for 18, and where we're looking at revenues for this fiscal year as well, we were looking at a budget that was really 7 to $8 million higher than what was adopted last year. So we were using that as a starting point to work backwards. So budget to budget, there's only a $1.8 million difference. Overall, there's almost a $10 million difference between where we were spending and what the balance budget is going to be for next year. So a couple of points to draw your attention to on this graphic. In FY 2016, if you look at the fund balance line of $4.1 million, that's the amount of money that was taken out of fund balance to balance the books at the end of the year based on the fact that we overspent, based on health care, based on decreasing revenues. And FY17, and we still aren't through the entire year yet, the financials that I'm going to review with you um, at the end of uh, this committee meeting are actually through uh, July. So you still have a couple of months, but we're anticipating a $4.6 million dip into fund balance due to the unbudgeted ATU retros that we did this year. And again, I've talked about that a couple of times during our discussions on our finances. Also, the continued decrease in fair and past revenue that we're seeing. So those coupled together resulted in that $77 million budget number that we had to decrease from. But if you look in the FY 2018 column for fund balance, even though it's a negative number, that simply means that we're not spending it. That means that we are making a commitment, as we have discussed multiple times, of dropping the the increase in ad valorem to fund balance. Now, this isn't the entire increase based on the fact that I brought forth a balanced budget this morning. We used about $400,000 of that anticipated revenue to balance the budget. Again, ad valorem is budgeted at 95%, again, per state law. So that number you're seeing is really 95% of what we anticipate bringing in that we can drop to fund balance. Typically, over the last couple of years, we have brought in 105, 108% of ad valorem. So we are still looking at a very optimistic view of bringing in $3 million to be able to drop the fund balance starting in FY18. And our plan over the next five years is to continue to drop that amount into fund balance to build up a reserve of $15 million that won't be touched by cash flow issues throughout the year. So that's our target. So the balance budget that we have today did indeed use just a very small fraction, but 84% of the overall increase is still anticipated to drop the fund balance. We'll talk a little bit about our anticipated revenues for next year. 2.7 million of Avalorum, again, 84% of the total is dropping to fund balance, and we have the commitment, and feel very strongly that the budget that we're bringing forth for next year really matches our spending patterns and addressing some of those issues and drivers that have made us spend more than we anticipated during the year, including health care, including operational internal costs, which I'm going to talk about some, some issues that are before you today as action items that are actually on the agenda to address some of these overspent issues in the future. Fair pass revenue, $1.2 million reduction from 16 to 17 which is affecting this year, an additional $450,000 reduction due to mission max and ridership fluctuations based on the service changes that we're anticipating going into FY18. Again, based on those service changes, 
our federal formula funding, our 5307 funding, which we talk about, and I'll talk about again in our financial uh, review today, uh, will be affected um, very slightly based on the fact that the formula takes into account not only overall population of the MSA and the region, but also the number of revenue miles for every jurisdiction that has over 200,000 citizens as its population. So as we decrease revenue miles and revenue hours, it does affect the overall formula, but not in a huge amount, right around half of a million dollars. And then we're looking at additions of new revenue. And we made a commitment uh, during the board meeting, uh, during the COA, uh, uh, Mr. Ash had gone over our goals and our, our, our strategy for next year. And one of them is bringing in new revenues to the organization and building on the work that we've done in the past with, with the leasing of our park and rides such as, as Hidden River and Megabus and Red Coach and those types of, of initiatives to bring in additional revenue. And again, they're not federal formula size revenue or ad valorem size revenue, but they are revenues to come in and be able to build upon and drop the fund bounds or use for initiatives that normally we wouldn't have the funding for. And they include a, a complete comprehensive review of our, our surplus property. We have uh, one specific parcel on Casey Road that we're looking at uh, over the next six months, and we will be coming back to the committee and the board for further discussion um, to sell off. We're looking at ATMs in many of our sites. We're already looking at them along the streetcar line, which would benefit uh, THS on the streetcar, but we're also looking at various sites uh, within our uh, transfer stations, um, et cetera, for the placement of ATMs, fee-based. Not a lot of money, but it's still revenue that is unaccounted for at the moment. And then in the next 30 to 60 days, uh, Mr. Burns and I will be bringing to you uh, a project where we will be looking at leasing cell tower space on some of our locations uh, throughout the county. And that is some additional revenues that we may be looking at um, in the coming year uh, and years uh, to follow. So we're looking at about $450,000 of additional revenues anticipated for next year, just based on these sources and these sources alone. On the expense side, now, of course, all of the savings that we've incurred over the past year and through Mission Max ha has had a net effect. So for the expenses that we've been able to reduce on the operating side, we've also had, as you've seen in the revenue side, we've had to mitigate uh, decreases in, in additional passengers and passenger revenue, as well as on the formula side. Now, on the expense side, while we did reduce millions of dollars of, of expenses, it's also netted out. We, are, we did add some things back in that we absolutely needed to, uh, to be able to support the organization that, that is going to perform the services of the next couple of years. So a $5.5 million net reduction in oper operating costs due to Mission Max. Again, it's netted based on that revenue. We eliminated $2 million from one-time expenditures. As you recall, as we started this budget process this year, we started with a zero-based approach. The entire organization was stripped down and to look at what, what minimally needed to be able to be supported financially in the service model that existed at that time. So essentially, we deconstructed the budget. We looked at all of the areas in which we overspent and had to go into fund balance and we trued those up. We anticipated where we, could, where we could reduce savings in those areas, but we had to have a realistic approach that if we have been consistently overspending in healthcare, we needed to properly budget healthcare. At the same time, we concurrently tried to reduce those costs just so we didn't dig into fund balance. We're gonna drop $3 million in, but if we have to go back and take part of that out, it defeats the purpose from the very beginning. So why not try to mitigate those as we plan for Worst case, best case occurs. So we added, if fringes, we added another $2.5 million into our health care. Now, historically, we have overspent 1.8 to 2. So we're looking at a very conservative approach of 2.5, saying if the world exists exactly the way it does for the last two years into next year, we won't dig into fund balance. We'll be properly budgeted for that. However, if we reduce cost savings, if we reduce expenses in healthcare and claims, 
that money obviously will drop the fund balance in addition to that $3 million. So the idea is to mitigate it as much as we can, but plan for the worst case scenario. We've increased risk, general liability, and workers' comp for $400,000. And again, those are areas in which we saw overspends based on a lack of good budgeting in those areas or a realization of, of what we really needed to budget. So we trued that up this year as well. The taxi voucher program has been very successful. We added another $700,000 to that program for next year. The two items on your agenda today uh, that, that I'll talk about when they come up, uh, we are looking at moving some of our internal support functions. And again, we mentioned this early in the year that we were looking at this. Uh, moving some of those support functions outside. Cash counting, we have over $7 million a year of cash and coin that flows through our organization. We are one of very few organizations nationwide that still use in-house personnel to manage that money. We're moving away from that. We've also talked about the movement to ADP. Um, specifically in our conversations, we've talked about the payroll <coughs> function. It's going to be much broader than that. And again, I'll talk about that as, as the contract comes up before you later this morning. However, for the savings that we're looking in the ROI for those, there's an expense that has to be incurred to be able to bring those in, at least in the first year. So those are accounted for here as well. And then we, as you know, uh, we're very proud of this. We have uh, deployed a wireless and will have wireless deployed to all of our vehicles this year, including the streetcar, including the majority of our facilities. That's an increase of $200,000 due to the expenses from Verizon for the bandwidth and the, and the streaming of that service. Now, we are actively, as, as an organization, looking at Verizon uh, and looking at our contract to be able to reduce those costs going into next year. There are other transit agencies in the state of Florida, some of which some of our folks have previously worked at, that are getting much better deals than we are. It's time for us to take them to task and try to reduce those costs uh, for us and for our taxpayers. On the capital budget, we have a $29.4 million capital budget uh, proposed for next year. Now, what's unique about this capital budget is that it will be the first time in almost a decade that there has been little to no local money going into our capital program. Typically, we have some ad valorem that's planned. Around $2 million this year was actually planned to move into capital. We had to pull that money back and keep it in operating. So this year, this money represents federal and state grant programs. Again, our emphasis uh, our, is on our bus replacements. We're looking at 22 new CNG vehicles for next year. We're looking at, and we have mentioned this uh, prior as well, we're looking at a, a new maintenance facility. Uh, we do have federal funding of $5.1 million to renovate. However, um, uh, staff has chosen to look at the total replacement of that building. As a matter of fact, we are uh, submitting um, this week an application for the bus and bus facilities grant application um, for that facility. If that doesn't uh, come to fruition, uh, we are looking at uh, creative ways of, of financing uh, for that facility. It will save us money, lots of money over the next few years if we move to that type of, of replacement versus investment in a, in a facility that could, as we start to get in there, start to tear things apart. It's a 30-year-old facility. Lots of surprises could be awaiting us. So we want to be able to move forward with that. Continued and final implementation of Flamingo. Next year at this time, we will be fully implement, implemented in our smart card program that not only we, but the region has embraced and moved forward over the last two years. AV pilot project is here, is included in, in the capital program. A modernization of our facility security surveillance system, our cameras, uh, not only to protect our employees, our patrons, and our assets are being deployed and purchased, and then continued deployment of wireless infrastructure that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So there's nothing super large in this, such as new facilities, um, but it is a focus on our internal infrastructure, uh, our continued bus replacement, 
with the CNG technology, um, uh, operator break rooms, and, and so on for our specific um, needs internally. Oh, a couple questions. Um, unless you want to finish up, I had a couple questions on this chart. And that concludes my presentation on the proposed <laughs> FY18 <laughs> capital and operating budget. Thanks. Well, I'll go ahead and kick it off just to, uh, as long as it's on the top of my mind here. Um, uh, the, the, if you, if, if, would it be possible to, uh, when this uh, if the same presentation goes to the board, to uh, attribute or, or to divide these uh, line items up on the capital projects by state and federal funding? Is there any... Yeah. any Yes, sir. Uh, the presentation that we were presented at the public hearings, we'll have the pie charts and we'll have the, the, okay, the graphics that we typically do um, for those hearings. Great. Okay. And then uh, the next question and then a possible discussion here um, is uh, the grant that you mentioned for the property, would that be a federal grant? Um, for the maintenance facility? For the maintenance facility. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Just want to clarify. Okay. And so on that note, and this is just maybe some opening up a new business at the board, not today, but Rich, you know, I was thinking it was... State uh, appointees, you know, maybe we can, in a, you know, at the next board meeting, just have a discussion on, you know, how much money we get from the state and are there opportunities. And uh, so, just a thought. So, since we can't talk about that outside of this, so it could be good. Okay, that's all I have. Are there any uh, any questions on the presentation, Mr. McClain? Um, first off, Jeff, I want to uh, commend you on the brief uh, and the brief you provided uh, most of us in one on one. Um, I think where we were at six, eight, nine months ago, um, we were all looking at that with a, a little bit of concern. I would say going forward, I like what I see, um, and you've done, you and your staff have done yeoman's work in kind of pulling this back in, if you will. Um, uh, two things I would say, continue that work, of course, uh, but, but good on the staff for doing that. Um, one thing I would like to see is, as you do brief, and it might be in your briefing for the full board, is uh, the fund balance um, chart you used to show with the bar and where we're at. I would recommend you show that also, showing that uh, where we're at right now and then where we're going to in FY18 so folks realize what the fund balance is going to be. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, Mr. Rowe? Uh, yeah, and I'm looking at the, um, and I know it's one of the smaller items here, but the wireless um, increase. It seems to me a few years ago before we implemented this, um, we were told that possibly there would be some advertising that would pay for the wireless service. Did that pan out, or have we stopped pursuing that, or am I remembering something incorrectly? <laughs> you are absolutely remembering it correctly. Uh, at the point that we engaged in getting wireless in all the vehicles, what we had from research from our various uh, marketing vendors was that we could potentially do some advertising that would pay for what was going on with the full purchase of the wireless. Uh, the market ended up not being as lucrative as we had hoped, but a separate point of that is the wireless is on there not for our, our passengers. The wireless is on there so it can facilitate the fair communications going forward. So we were less looking for a vendor that would be able to shoulder the burden of getting big bandwidth and more of, is there a sponsor we could get to come on and carve out a little piece of that? And that was something else which made it less attractive. But we will circle back with our marketeers I can get an update on who's still doing that. Are we getting more advertising revenue from commuter advertising or some other areas as well? So we'll do some follow-up. Okay. And then just another comment. I mean, I'm sure you all are up on this, and you even kind of mentioned it. Um, I recently, um, I tried a couple times. I had been a loyal customer, and I won't name the name of the, the Internet service provider, but it cut my bill in half. I'm saving 85 a month um, by going with a new provider, so, you know. It never hurts to we'll talk after the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not naming names, and but uh, just put that out And we need to talk there. after the <laughs> We want to. Yeah. I have glasses, and I need to talk to you. So. Oh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Kemp. Thank you. Just like to add my uh, good word in here for, I think, an incredible job on putting this together. And I think it obviously faced with incredible challenges, too, in doing this. So um, my... Um, congratulations or thank you to the staff for doing such a good job with this. I also concur that it would be good just to see that breakdown in uh, state and uh, federal funding just to kind of have a better idea of what, where these funds are coming from. Right. Thank you, Commissioner Kim. Anyone else? 
All right. Well, um, again, I, I definitely would like to echo just very briefly the sentiments. Uh, Jeff, great job, staff. Great job. I just think, you know, not only just presenting the information, but also, you know, the briefings we've had and uh, taking the time to keep us informed and, uh, you know, not, not just before this meeting, but, but even, you know, kind of leading up to it and, and what Mr. McLean uh, acknowledged. So great job. Thank you very much. We are going to transition to our Director of uh, Human Resources now to do an update on our health care plans. Uh, Brooke, I believe we introduced you, but this is, you haven't presented that much, so Brooke Biscate, our Director of Human Resources. One thing that has popped up in conversations with board members is um, if we could get a rabbit out of the hat, and I don't mean that as in a joking term, but if we could balance the budget now and do all this work, why not in previous years? And I think Brooke's conversation on health care can amplify that a little bit. Uh, when we had a really bad health care year two years ago, our, our broker and all the vendors will, oh, it's a bad year. We had a second bad year. Brooke can give us a better perspective on uh, we've changed brokers, we have changed how we budget, we've stopped taking everyone's word that next year won't be as bad of a year. Um, so we're just in a different perspective on uh, that, and the benefits team has worked tirelessly on this work as well, so take it away. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, as Ms. Egan said, about um, our health plan and kind of where we are um, going with our request for proposals. Um, one of the things that the board had mentioned was partnering. So I want to talk about that first. We did look at partnering with PSTA, Hillsborough County, and the City of Tampa. Um, PSTA actually included us in their RFP. And um, just to put it kind of simple, to unhealthy groups did not make a good match. So um, it would raise their rates almost 50% in one case. Another scenario was 80%. Um, that would include, include us raising our rates. So it just wasn't something that we could do together. Hillsborough County had something they called a buy-in, and it was a, an average of $5,200 per person. With our group, that would have been $3.5 million. So that would go into their reserves. If we had a good year, we did not get that money back. Um, that would stay with Hillsborough County. Um, so again, a good thing for them, not necessarily a good thing for us. They did mention um, making kind of a payment plan over three years, but that's still over a million dollars each year when we're already trying to make sure that we're budgeted properly and we have had increases. So um, something again that did not work. The city of Tampa, they have United Healthcare. Um, they looked at United Healthcare. And it was a similar situation. Our numbers did not help them. It was more of a nuisance, I think, for them because we don't have high numbers as far as employee base and dependents. Um, the only place we might have seen a little bit of savings because our claims are our claims. No matter if you know we're with the city, we're by ourselves, or with PSTA, our claims are our claims. So the administrative services only fees, when you're self-insured, that's where we have Cigna and they um, pay our claims. We pay them and then they pay our claims. Um, that did not give us any kind of significant savings that would make it worth the time and effort to move over to the city of Tampa for them or for us. So kind of the same situation in the, in the three scenarios. So right now, we're continuing to look, um, you know, in the years to come about partnering if we could. We had um, a change in broker. We're back with Gallagher Bassett. The city of Tampa also has Gallagher Bassett, so they are going to look at that to kind of see where we are. They'll have more information with our claims now that we're with them. And again, kind of watch that progress. So it's something that's not just gone away forever, but right now it's not um, you know, something that would be uh, beneficial to either party. Um, so that's where we are with our partnering. Hey, Brooke, just a, yes. a quick question. You said unhealthy when it came to Pinellas and us working together. Can you further clarify what you mean? We have um, our employee base, both of us, we have a sedentary group. Um, you know, they're, most of our employees drive buses, and then we have office jobs. So um, that's really hard to keep people up and moving, especially our bus operators. In our offices, you know, we can take breaks. We can eat healthier sometimes. Um, for our bus operators, it's, it's very difficult for them when they're on, they're on the road. Um, you know, grab and go is, is usually not healthy. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to try to help with that, because there are things that we can do. But that's kind of the, you know, the unhealthy employee base is, is basically that. Okay. Yeah, I was I was thinking unhealthy in terms of financial. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so. so this is our timeline. Um, we went out to bid for all of our um, medical, dental, and ancillary products in July. We got those back um, August eighth, 
and our broker is compiling all of those reports, the documents, putting them into something. Um, if you've ever seen an RFP, I have two boxes in my office that have probably 20 binders for six providers. So it's a lot of information. They'll condense that for us and put it into something that um, is easy for us to, to look at and read and explain. So they're supposed to meet with us today to go over the initial findings. Um, and you'll see that we had six medical uh, proposals. Cigna is included in all of those, and they are our current broker at the time um, for medical and dental. Vision Solstice is our current broker, and they did provide a proposal. We had seven vision proposals. Long-term, um, Unum is our, is our provider, and they did a proposal, and they're also our life in um, AD&D. So we, um, again, don't know anything at this time. We'll find out later today. We'll share that information with the executive team later this month and then you'll see kind of a gap between August and October it doesn't mean that we aren't doing anything with that um, that's the behind the scenes stuff that my staff and I do as far as making our booklets um, getting all of our information together putting in new rates um, into our system to make sure that we take out the proper rates and then informing our employees which is going to be a huge thing for open enrollment and that's one thing no matter what we do I want to make sure that we communicate a lot more with our employees about what we have to offer, whoever our provider is. We have a lot of different um, services that are provided as far as weight management, stress management, diabetes management, and we want to make sure that we talk to our employees not just once a year at open enrollment but throughout the year to make sure that they know, again, what is provided to them and what can um, help them live a healthier life. So open enrollment begins October 24th, and um, our um, actually, the plan starts January 1st, so they'll get enrolled, we'll get them in whatever plan they want, and again, that's time and effort from, from my staff to make sure that we're ready to roll in January. We will have a broker RFP go out pretty soon. Um, the broker that we have now, Gallagher Bassett, they're through February to make sure that we have our plan year January 1st, that it's up and running and good to go, um, and then we will be looking at um, broker services. And I mentioned... Um, at one point, you know, going out to bid for any kind of service um, is time consuming and it's a lot of work on, on my staff and, and our brokers. Um, but I think that it's a good thing sometimes to make sure they stay on their game, kind of like we were talking about with the phone bills. <laughs> sometimes it's good to change, sometimes it's good to just remind your provider that you're the customer. So we are going to do that with our broker too. We have uh, looked at a couple of options for cost savings, and I'll go over some other things too. And again, once we get what we have back from our broker today, that'll give us some better ideas about um, what are the, the people who put in the bids, what they're going to give us, and the rates that they've provided to see if there's any additional cost savings. But we've looked at a number of things. We have four different health plans. We have a couple of HRAs, a base and an enhanced, and then we have some a base plan and a buy-up plan. They're called open access plans. We're looking at maybe eliminating those open access plans. They um, cost heart money. They cost the employee money, and we feel like our employees could be... Um, you know, it would benefit our employees to be in those two other areas, those those health reimbursement accounts. So we're looking at that. Um, the first option would be that low cost HRA and base plan remains. Mm -hmm. Some minor changes, um, shift in premium splits. We are looking at that from heart to the employee, and um, it would be the least disruptive because we're really just eliminating the two higher plans, and they would still have those base plans. Option two would be eliminate the base and the buy up plans. Still the low cost HRA. But a lot of people get a little nervous when they don't have a copayment. Everyone's used to that old HMO, and that's definitely gone. Um, but with a enhanced HRA, we could have some copays for office visits and specialists and set amounts when you know you're going to urgent care in the emergency room. And that seems to help employees understand a little bit better what's going on. Because if you go in and it's unknown, it's $100, that's scary to an employee. So we want to make sure that they have something that will you know, make them feel a little bit better about going to the doctor because we want them to go, and I'll talk a little bit, sometimes we don't want them to go to the emergency room, but we do want them to go when they're sick and we want them to feel comfortable with that. Again, we are looking at employee splits. Um, I want to be cautious with it and be um, sensitive to our employees. Our average employee, a bus operator, makes $13.27 an hour when they start. So, um, you know, in the private sector, Public doesn't typically pay as much as they do, but our stick is that we have good benefits. That's, you know, the FRS retirement and our health plan. And so I do want to keep that in mind from an HR standpoint as a recruiter um, to get, you know, good quality employees. We want to make sure that we have something that we can recruit with and our benefits are that thing. So I do want to be mindful of that. And, um, you know, I know that employees do need to pay, but I do want to, again, be mindful of our employee base and make sure that they can afford their insurance. 
Any questions there? What's the current split right now? Um, for our base plan, it's about um, it's almost ten percent, um, and and then ninety percent paid by the by by heart. So there there is some things that we can do. I think that we could move some of that to the employee, but again, um, we looked at an eighty twenty split, and it doubled the family rate. So that's that's rough, you know. In terms of premium, not the overall cost. But Correct. By weekly premium. Okay, Correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, question, Brooke. Um, you mentioned uh, com being competitive and, and recruiting. Uh, do we have data on our competitors on what their splits are? We do. Um, so Hillsborough County and the city of Tampa, for just their, their employee-only base plan, they pay 100% for the employee. So they pay, Hart would pay, if we, if we followed that, 100%. Um, for a family plan, for us, we pay almost 14% um, the employee, and Hart pays about 87%, or 86%. Um, if you look at PSTA, the family plan, they have the employee pay 41%. And the, the PSTA actually pays 58. So, um, again, City of Tampa family plan, 26%, and about 73.81 the employer pays. Hillsborough County, um, they pay 15% um, the employee and 85% for the single plan. And then 8.4%, I was surprised by this, for the family plan goes to the employee, and Hillsborough actually pays 91.6%. So... You, you see the others. We've got we've got some room um, and to keep in mind again what our employee base makes, the average salary. Um, you know, I don't want somebody to their whole paycheck goes to health care and they can't pay rent or gas or food. So um, you know, we've got to keep that in mind too. But there are some things that we can do. And again, today when we see what happens with our bids, that will give us an idea too of where we can move forward and where we can save money. Um, just a quick follow up question on that. So PSTA, it looks like. You know that that's a pretty notable split. Um, given that our, you know our, our employees are, are probably not going to um, move rapidly, you know, between uh, transit properties across the state, you know, from Jacksonville to Miami, um, is there any wisdom in getting additional transit property splits just as a comparison? We definitely could. Okay. We definitely could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other any other questions? And, and go ahead, if that, oh, Mr. Bowers. Yes, thank you. Uh, do we have any numbers on the percentage of uh, our employees that have family coverage as opposed to the single employee? I don't have it right in front of me, but I know that it's definitely higher than, than the single employee. We have a lot of employees who cover family. And I think you said that, but I'm asking again. Uh, what's the difference between uh, our, our cost for the single employee and the family. What, what's that, that split again? A single employee is going to pay $42.38, and then Hart pays $608 of that. So about 6.5% versus Hart paying 935 Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other we questions? have, just to give you an idea too, around um, 680 employees covered under our insurance, and we have about 1,200 um, with dependents, so you know, almost another 600 more with that. Okay. Oh, uh, Commissioner Kemp. Thank you. If we're going to look at the split that other transit agencies are having, and that's, I, I think, valuable. I think we also should look at their um, salary rates and um, have that all information also available. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, please proceed, Mark. So here's some additional savings that we can look at and we are looking at. Um, Cigna has, and I'm going to say Cigna because that's who we have right now, but pretty much any provider that we could go to would have some of this, a similar plan. Um, but they have something called Health Healthcare Matters. Um, so it is inpatient care management and advocacy pre-admission and post-admission um, discharge outreach. And so that's hugely important. A lot of employees will go back after they've been discharged you know, from some type of surgery, whether it was inpatient or outpatient, um, because something's wrong. And so they have an advocate. Sometimes it's because they're scared and maybe they're running a fever and they, they kind of freak out and say, I better go back to the emergency room. So they'll have an advocate that they can call and actually a nurse advocate and talk to and say, okay, 
take some Tylenol and you'll be okay, or are you doing X, Y, Z? Okay, you need to go to the ER. Um, We're also doing that with disease management, where when you go to the doctor, um, they funnel that information to Cigna, and you'll get a phone call no matter what it's for. Um, And I told Ms. Egan, you know, sometimes I'll get a phone call and it frustrates me because I don't need to tell them, you know, that I need to lose weight or I need to do this or that because I already know, but I know that it's beneficial. And what we want is to just talk to the advocate, and they can talk you through some things. We've had a few people um, come to us and say, you know, I actually talked to them and I had one gentleman tell me he has lost 70 pounds and he's off medication. Um, So there are things like that that we can do that will help and, you know, the preventative care, catching things on the front end, that's why we do a lot with our wellness and biometrics to try to catch those things on the front end. Um, Some kind of diabetes, heart disease, instead of the massive heart attack or the quadruple bypass or, um, you know, now I have diabetes and I didn't before, catching that on the front end. So that's what that disease management is all about. You can see what the health matters. Um, Care management, a projected savings is around uh, 70,000 annually. Another thing that we're doing is the value preferred drug listing through Cigna um, promotes usage usage of generic, and we have a really good almost 80% generic usage rate, um, but it's getting that other 14% to say, do you really need that preferred brand or or that um, non-preferred brand? And another thing that we're looking at is pushing um, anything that's over the counter now looking at that and saying, do you really need to pay for a prescription? Does heart need to pay for a prescription? And there is a tier or step plan that they go through to make sure that we're not going to harm anyone because there are people who have to take that non-preferred brand. They've tried everything, and we know that. Um, That's one thing about being self-insured. We have the ability to say they have been through that tier program and we're okay with that because it's it's for their health and that makes sense. When you're fully insured, you don't have um, really any leeway there. Um, Another thing with being self-insured is at the end of the day, the provider takes on the risk when they're fully insured and will have claims plus that risk. So we feel like we're moving in a really good direction, proper budgeting, the wellness plans that we have, and some of these changes that we're making that we'll see savings. And we get to keep that savings when we're self-insured. If Cigna says you need $7 million to go, um, and at the end of the year we spend $6 million, they would keep the million. Um, When we're self-insured, we get to keep that million, and that's what we're shooting for is looking at cost savings throughout each year and putting some of that back into the reserves. Um, With the preferred drug listing, again, there's a lot of things we can do there. And and going back to my saying, you know, we're going to make our providers work for us, this is another thing. Cigna, a lot of our providers have... um, a pharmacy management program, but we've got to stay on top of that, and that's why we really need a great broker, too, to stay on top of them with those um, pharmacy brands and making sure that we get the best rates, the best discounts. If there is some kind of coupon that gets it free for an employee, we need to know about that and instead of um, Hart having to pay, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for these prescriptions. So, again, a good broker staying on top of that helps us save money in the long run as, long run as well. So that's the end of my presentation. Again, um, I'm excited to see what the RFP brought, uh, what the providers brought to the table. I'm excited to see what Cigna brought um, and move forward and, and see some more cost savings. We have a lot of ideas and a lot of plans, a lot of communication, again, throughout the year to make sure our employees know what's going on and that they're aware of their health. Um, you know, we're moving into this consumer-driven health care. We have been for a while, but really... Making sure the employee knows when you go to the doctor, even when you pay that $10 copay, that your employer pays a lot more than $10. And so um, emergency room, you know, steerable events, should you go to the emergency room, and on average it costs $2,000 just to sign in. That's for heart, $2,000. Um, that doesn't count, you know, your $45 for two Tylenols and things like that. So we want people to go when they need to, but we have urgent care. And then even urgent care, there's steerable urgent care events. If you have, you know, a cough, we have MD Live, we have the Mediclinics, you know, at, at Publix and Walgreens and CVS. So really... Um, just educating our employees again throughout the year and making sure they know what's going on and making wise decisions because at the end of the day, claims drive our numbers and that drives premiums. And they need to know that you know everybody taking care of themselves, it does affect everybody else. Okay, great. Thank you for the presentation. Any uh, follow-up questions? Mr. Bowers? Uh, yes, I maybe I missed something, but some time ago we were discussing looking at the difference between self-insured and going back being fully insured and did we ever get any numbers back based on what would be the uh, what we are in terms of savings or on either side? That's part of our RFP. We ask for fully insured and self insured proposals. So we'll see that today to see what that looks like. Thank you.
Well, just to clarify, when you say we'll see that today, it, so this, this this presentation it will be then coming to the full board, or, or what is the context? Because this uh, wasn't this on the agenda. The, yeah, this is part of the finance presentation. Okay. So, um, so it will be well, it will yeah, be. Because okay. clearly we've had a lot of questions about what's going on with health care. When uh, Ms. Biscate is saying we'll see today, it's, we have the actual bid opening evaluation, and the, the committee will kick off today. Within the week, recommendations will come to the executive team, and... Mm -hmm. As this will be processed as a regular procurement item, the board will see that. Gotcha. But okay. the board, again, the, the procurements that the board actually weighs in on are uh, lobbying and legal. And is there anything else or something else on that list? And audit. So there's a otherwise rest of the authorities okay. dedicated to staff. Great. So we'll get you that information. Uh, and again, this will remain part of the budget presentation. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you. I think, you know, just a quick comment. This is a great follow-up, I think, to a lot of questions and ideas and suggestions that came up as we've been talking about this, and I, I really appreciate the follow-up. Thank, thank you, you, staff, and thank you. All right, thank you much. All right, next up we have committee action items. First is uh, agenda item 2A. Mr. Seward. Good morning, Jeff Seward, Chief Financial Officer for HART. Um, again, as I mentioned in uh, the budget presentation, um, we took a real hard look at our internal processes this year um, to really focus on what's required to support our, our primary mission, and uh, that's buses on the street. So to do that, we looked at a, a couple of uh, specific processes. Um, one, the first before you today, um, is our, our cash counting processes. We have a, a cash counting room that houses four full-time um, equivalents, and that is our job daily, is, ca is counting the dollar bills and the coins that come through, ensuring that they're accounted for, they're bagged, and then turned over to uh, a, a delivery service, an arm and car delivery service to have um, delivered to the bank. So before you today is a contract with Mid-Florida um, armored and ATM services to not only take care of the, the pr processes that they typically have done for us in the past, which are maintenance of our ATMs, um, uh, exchanging them out, um, uh, supplementing them, and implementing them with, with funding, um, as well as a transfer of our funds back and forth to the bank. Uh, we are adding our cash counting um, services um, as well. Um, that will be the reduction uh, of the count room function of, of four FTEs. And originally, we started with an 8% reduction in total costs. Um, through some keen negotiations from Mr. Burns, we were able to move that 8% to 14% cost savings a year. So before you today is a contract with Mid-Florida for a base term of two years with three year one options for a total not to exceed amount of $969,875. That equates to $193,975 a year. And that is a, will equate to a 14% savings of what we actually spend right now having that service in house. Now something that is not in here and something that I'm sure Mr. Burns will burn in the back of my head with his eyes when I say this right now is that our cash counting over the next couple of years, I anticipate not being what it is, exists today. Once we implement Flamingo over the next couple of years, I truly believe that our cash collection will start to reduce. So after the first two year completion of this contract, we're going to reassess exactly what those collection activities are and see what can be modified. But as it exists today, we feel very confident of mid floors capabilities and moving this function out of the building. Okay. Any questions? Discussion? So move. Second. 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 Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, like sign. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seward. And I believe uh, item B, you are up again. Sticking with the theme of cost savings. Uh, some time ago, and some time ago was actually uh, almost two years ago, we first entertained um, uh, auto automatic data processing, ADP. Uh, to come in and, and look at our payroll functions. Uh, for a myriad of reasons at that time, um, we, we didn't move forward with that. Um, however, about a year ago, well, actually, during this year, uh, Justin Day of the advocacy group and I had a conversation, and he asked if we had ever um, looked at ADP. And I had mentioned our, our prior experience, and he put us in contact with um, AD, ADP representatives in which we had not talked to before. 
Happy to report that we're recommending today approval of a uh, base term of a three-year fixed price with two-year one options for a total not to exceed amount of $252,000 to ADP. Now, in the past, we were specifically looking at only our payroll function. However, what we are bringing forward is a much more robust platform that we are going to be able to implement over the next year. And that includes not only the administration of new hiring, um, health and welfare administration, ADP health compliance, talent management solutions. There's a learning management system that's involved in, in this platform. It's going to be hosted. We have our W-2s, W-9 management, I-9 management. All of it is being will be managed by ADP. Now, the budget that is in there for next year is only about $50,000 due to the fact that we don't pay the full ramp up until after it's fully implemented. So the total ROI and total impact of this has not been truly identified. High level cost savings look at about $500,000 a year after implementation. Hard cost savings around 220. However, we don't know the number of FTEs that will be affected, in which department they'll be affected, and we probably won't know really until about this time next year, but this contract allows us to move forward to start that process. Thank you, Jess. Great presentation. Uh, Mr. Roche? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, did we seek any other vendors, or did we uh, work solely with ADP? We work solely with ADP. And the vehicle contract, which Mr. Burns can talk about, if he so desires, is a cooperative purchasing network contract that ADP has that is nationwide. And right now it's through um, the Education Service Center in Houston, Texas. That's the, the program, that, or the contract vehicle that we're utilizing for this contract. And, and is this proprietary? Would we be locked in? Um, I mean, would we foresee being able to go out for a bit in the future when our two years is up? Or absolutely, since it's hosted. The author, uh, shaking his head vigorously. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's, it, it's a hosted program, and, and three or four years from now, we're not satisfied. We're looking at a different direction. We absolutely can go back up. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay, all right. Any other questions or comments? And, and just to just to clarify, you, you mentioned savings. We will see savings by this. Is that I mean, es estimated? There's just no. I mean, this is a matter of degree of savings. Based based on the FTEs and, and the contracts that we use right now to support the, these services, the minimum amount of savings is over two hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. We have risk savings, a potential risk mitigation of errors that can cause us fees, um, penalties that can go up to five hundred thousand dollars a year. Great. But as far as the number of FTEs that will be affected by this at heart, we can't confidently say what that number will be right now, but there will be some change over the next year. Great. Thank you. Well, sounds efficient and smart. And Mr. Roche, I you know, appreciate your question. And, uh, are there any other questions or discussion? Second. 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 All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The aye is carried. Thank you, Mr. Seward. Thank you, staff. And last on the agenda, item three, discussion item. We have our monthly financial review. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> In your packet, and uh, <clears throat> to Mr. McLean's comment earlier during our budget presentation, there is a cash flow diagram. In our presentation uh, that we will give in the public hearings of next month, uh, we will not only have current, but we'll have a historical perspective on not only our ad valorem collections, but our, our fund balance, our fund balances per year over the last ten years as well. Do you know what page that is in the packet? Three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. Thank you. No, it's a chart. I'm sorry. You yeah, have a graph. The graph you referenced on the lower half of the page. I don't, we don't, yeah. don't see it. I can describe it to you. Okay. It's cash balance and we have money. But as we typically talk about every month now with this committee is, is just an overview of, of where we are as far as our, our financials are concerned. I gave a little bit of an, uh, uh, an inclination of, of where we anticipate ending during the budget presentation this year. Um, uh, right now, um, our uh, major revenues are looking at 93% with our expenditures at 86% at spend. Now, that includes ad valorem that we had originally appropriated for capital. We are not able to, we're, we're going to need that revenue to pull back in to spend for operating this year. So, again, this is 
uh, through July. We still have a couple more months left. We'll be coming back to you uh, with a year end of where we actually end up with cash in the bank. Right now, uh, as of 731, we have $11.6 million in the bank. I can tell you that as of yesterday, yesterday, Friday, uh, there was $7 million. We are again awaiting um, our $11 million of federal formula funding as we do each year. We mentioned last year that we changed our processes to ensure we applied early. We followed that. The holdup has now been in one. There are many federal agencies. There are two primarily that, that process this. Obviously, one is the FTA. The other is the Department of Labor. They are not fully staffed <laughs> at the senior decision-making um, levels. So it is a little bit now elongated process um, of it coming back, going forward. Um, I have sent a note to our FTA district, um, uh, Dr. Taylor, um, asking if she could help uh, move it along. But we have um, full um, confidence that we will have it uh, in time to close out the books at the end of the year and have that $11 million banked and booked. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them on specific financial questions. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I see none. Thank you, Mr. Seward. All right. And I believe that is our last agenda item, unless there's anything else. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great week. You're going to get asked to share everything.